Well, I hope you have a chance to gather with loved ones around the table this Thanksgiving. At our house, we have two things that, that we say every time after the meal. Thanks for dinner. May I please be excused? And I would love to say that, that my little girls have a perfect record. They never forget. It just wouldn't be the truth. And I try to tell the truth when I'm up here, as well as when I just normally live. But it's pretty special when they remember and when we don't have to ask them and they just, they're thankful. But what I'm realizing is that even as we get older, thankfulness is a trained habit. We have to teach ourselves to be thankful. We're, we're, we don't do it well naturally. And what I would say is that, that we're, we're good at what you might call lower level, reactionary thank, thank yous. So if, for example, it's, it's a holiday season. We usually amp up our gratitude meter around the holidays, right? Add a couple extra thank yous. Or, or when someone does something nice for you, maybe they give you a gift, or, or they help you out with something that you really couldn't do on your own. We're good at those thank yous. But the everyday, the, the, the out of the ordinary, those thank yous don't happen so much. You see, thankfulness I think we could all admit, it's not part of our 24-7 lifestyle. Gratitude is more of a one-off than an attitude for, for many of us. And I get it, I get it. Life's busy. I understand. I'm, I'm thankful that, that you've taken time out of your busy holiday weekend to be with us, to be at church this weekend. And so I, I realize you're busy. And, and I know you are a grateful person. But we just don't always say it, right? What would it look like if we made thankfulness our lifestyle? What would be the impact if gratitude was our attitude all the time? If our disposition each day was to be thankful, how would that impact your relationships with, with your kids and your grandkids, with your coworkers? with your friends? What would be the impact if we made gratitude our constant attitude? How would that change us personally? If you're a guest on this Thanksgiving weekend or you've been away for a little while, we have been studying the life of David. We've been looking at his story and, and so far we've, we've met the warrior king, we've met the king on the run, we, we've met the king who had that great, great fall. And we also met David the king who teaches us how to turn back to God after we've fallen. But we haven't spent too much time looking at David the poet. The wordsmith behind about half of the book of Psalms who was deeply in tune with his emotions. He, he knew the feeling of jubilee. He knew what it was to be depressed David understood anger, sadness, and thanksgiving. David knew it all, and, and on top of being a lover and a fighter and a king, David could be considered a worship leader. Now, he didn't probably shred a guitar like Craig, but he did know how to string a harp. And even more than that, he got God's heart. And David, what, what his story does, and actually, you know what you can do? is Just open up to Psalm 138. I want you to see it for yourself. Psalm 138, and by the way, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. So if you use the Pew Bible in front of you, or if you brought a different version, it might sound a little bit different to you, but that's okay. You just follow along, and I believe this, the words will be on the screen behind me. But, but here's the thing. If you find it hard to be grateful all the time, David gets it. <laughs> he knows what it's like to be a busy guy. He, he knows what it's like to have people hate him. He spent like 15 years of his life on the run from, from Saul trying to kill him. He, you think your family is dysfunctional. <laughs> David's family wrote the book, okay? And he had moments where he felt like a great failure. But as I said, he, he also knew God's heart. He was, we told you, week after week, he was called a man after God's heart. And so he knew that gratitude goes a long way 
toward being emotionally and spiritually healthy. In Psalm 38, David, David shows us the impact of gratitude. If you've had a chance to open it, follow along as I read. He says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness. For your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. Every king in all the earth will thank you, for all of them will hear your words. Yes, they will sing about the Lord's ways. For the glory of the Lord is very great. And though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble. But he keeps his distance from the proud. And though I am surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand, and the power of your right hand saves me. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you made me. In verse 1, David sets his mind toward the goal of gratitude. And as he does that, he discovers the, the first impact that gratitude can have. Gratitude changes our heart toward God. Gratitude changes our heart toward God. Uh, so the, the verse starts, I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. And that's the same word, by the way, in, in David's language, that give thanks, praise, uh, thank you in verse 4. Three times he says the same word, which basically means praise, I confess you, Lord, I acknowledge you, I thank you, Lord. And at the end of the day, this, this is what worship is. When, when we say the word worship in church and you're not really sure what we mean, this is it. Worship is our heart's response to God. And thanksgiving should be our heart's posture. Gratitude should be our go-to response to God every time. God's praise should be our aim every day. And then at the end of verse 1, David says, I'll sing your praises before the gods. Hmm, what's going on there? Well, maybe, maybe what David is saying is that I am now, God, going to sing so loudly that all of the creatures in heaven, all the angels are going to hear me. And and maybe the person in your pew makes that their goal every Sunday, right? I'm going to sing so loudly. Maybe that's what he's saying. Or what he could be saying is, God, I understand that in my culture, there's thousands of, of false gods around me. But you, God, you alone are the God. And I'm going to praise you. And think about it. Not a ton has changed in our day. You just have to look a little bit, and you can find thousands of gods or or other ideologies of our day. Probably the the biggest one right now is, I am my own God. People might not say it that way, but they say things like, "I'm, I'm finding myself. I need to be true to myself. And we live in a culture where there are thousands of ways to bring praise to other things that aren't God. We're, we're pretty good at bringing ourselves praise, but, but it takes conviction to say, God, in, in a culture that, that doesn't respect you, in a culture that doesn't get you or want you, in that culture, you, God, you are the one I'm going to praise. It continues in verse 2. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. In ancient Israel, the temple, or, or in David's day, the tabernacle, the big tent, is where you worship God. That's where his presence dwelled. You, you went to his presence, and then you worship. You do things like sacrifice, or, or, or sing, or read scriptures to each other. These, these were the ways they worshiped in those days. And David says, when I, when I get my head in, in the right space to, to begin going toward worship, when I start thinking about what it means to, to respond to you, God, it enlarges my view of you. Gratitude, uh, worship, this, this heart's posture of thankfulness, it enlarges our view of God, and it humbles us to the core. It, David says, as I start doing this, it gets me thinking about your character again, and I remember your love is unfailing. Your love is steadfast, it's loyal, it's committed. 
I'm reminded of your faithfulness, that, that you're trustworthy. I can, I can always trust you, God. You ever wonder why this right here, this moment that we call church is so important? It's not because church saves you. You might not even be changed by this message as much as that breaks my heart. But when we take time out of our day for God, out of our week to be intentional about focusing on God and his character and what he's done. When we sing songs like, like how great is our God and how great thou art, when we do these things, when we open God's word, the Bible, it's like we're coming face to face with the God of the universe. And it changes us. It changes the way we think about God. And it changes the way we respond so let's not, let's not forget who we're worshiping when, when we come to a place like this, but also just when we spend time talking to him during the week. Verse 2 finishes by saying that this is the God who, whose promises are backed by all the honor of your name. Have you ever met somebody and all of a sudden you discover that they're a person of influence? They, they take out their card and they give it to you. And, and you realize, oh my goodness, they own this huge company. I know that company. That's you? And then they tell you, yeah, 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 here's, here's my card, and you call any time and just tell them Bobby sent you, and they'll hook you up. <laughs> well, God, God's promises are a guarantee backed by the power of his name. God says, just, just give my name. <laughs> And it's a guarantee. My promises are always true, he says. Uh, uh, another way David is thinking about this is, is it's like he's saying, every time that I, that I think, God, you, you, you can't amaze me more. Like, like I've seen the ways you work. I, I know how you're going to work. It's like, it's like you just exceed my wildest, wildest expectations. You've outdone yourself again, God. Now tell me if you've been here. You're, you're reading a verse that you've read like a hundred times and then you glean something brand new from it. Like, oh, I didn't know that was there. That's amazing. I love that. Or, or you're in a situation that you've been in uh, before many times and then God does something unexpected. You're like, I did not see that going that way. God, you've exceeded my expectations of you. That same situation is what David is thinking about. The, the English Standard Version says, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. God's name and God's word, it's greater than all things. And, and so my encouragement to you, before you, you go to sing next time, next time you go to open your Bible, or even to talk to God in prayer, just pause. Take a deep breath. And remember who you're talking to. The God of the universe. And show him the respect he deserves. David endeavors to be thankful and his view of God is enlarged. Uh, Look at his changed perspective again in in verse 3. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by by giving me strength. Uh, I, I found myself as I was reading this verse... I thought to myself early in the week, man, man, I wish that was true in my life. Like, how awesome would it be be to say, every time I pray, God, you answer me. But then I got thinking about it, and maybe that's what, that was the instinct you had too, but don't miss that, that second line where he says, you encourage me or you embolden me by giving me strength. Derek Kidner, one of, one of the guys who, who writes about the Psalms, he says, it's not always the situation which most needs changing, it's often as not the person involved in it. See, God's answer to our prayers is not always changing our situation. Sometimes his answer is that he changes us. He gives us the courage to trust him through the hard thing that's going on. Uh, if you've ever put a request on our prayer alert, you, you've probably experienced this. There's something that happens when you're going through a trial and then you know the whole church family is praying for you where you experience God's peace and his comfort. 
And you're like, God, you answered my prayer. Not how I expected, but I know, I know that you answered my prayer. That's, that's David's experience here. And so he's made it his goal to have gratitude. He, he, as he does that, and as we do that, we'll be changed from, from the inside out. It enlarges our view of God. It, it humbles us, but the effect stretches even wider. Our gratitude begins to rub off on other people. And that's why in, in verse 4, David says, Every king in all the earth will thank you, Lord, for all of them will hear your words. Yes, they will sing about the Lord's ways, for the glory of the Lord is very great. See, secondly, gratitude causes other people to take notice. Thankfulness is contagious in a good way. The more thankful we are, the more other people notice God. David dreams, and he actually like almost prophetically says this day is coming when all the nations of the earth will know God's ways and will sing God's praise. Paul spoke of a similar day when he says that every knee and every tongue of those who are in heaven and those who are in earth and those who are under the earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. David is, like, is predicting that the whole earth will be filled with God's praise and, and implied in that is that people need to hear God's story through our lives. We, as Jesus did, need hearts of compassion for those who don't know God. And the way we live our lives with gratitude should be contagious toward those around us. They may not agree with our beliefs, they may not agree with our values, but when they look at your life, they should feel like something's missing from their life. It's that gratitude factor. And verse 6 it gives us one of the most beautiful ways that God's glory can be known on the earth. Verse 6 says that even though God is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. See, David's confidence doesn't rest in our ability to, to get the word out about God. He knows, verse 5, that that the glory of the Lord is very great, that God has knit into the fabric of his creation uh, the story of his greatness. And the more we look for God's glory, the more we will be able to see it. But, But though God is great, though he's high, he's mighty, he's what we might call transcendent, he's also near. He's close, he's intimate. He cares for us. He shows us mercy beyond what we deserve. What a beautiful truth. Maybe though, maybe you're thinking to yourself, that, that's, that's great for David. Yeah, verse 3, God, God answered his prayers. But, but that's not my experience. Like, I, I prayed. I prayed for years. And God still took my dad. I'm still praying and the cancer's spreading. It's Thanksgiving, and my, my own child won't come to church with me on Thanksgiving. You think I don't beg God each and every day to bring my child back? Maybe that's what you're feeling, or maybe something close to that is what you're feeling. And, and to that, I would just remind you, remember who wrote this psalm. This is David we're talking about, right? 15 years. He has a maniac stalker trying to kill him. This is the David who, who after the greatest fall in his life, uh, his, his child is dying, and for a week straight, he doesn't eat anything, he just prays and begs God, don't take this out on my child. And his child still dies. This is the David who, whose own son later in his life becomes his greatest enemy. He understands what it is to lose hope. If you were to read Psalm 22, also by David, the psalm opens by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David knew what it is to be depressed. You could probably argue from some of his psalms he knew what it was to be suicidal. And yet, as David's life went on, he started to understand God hadn't abandoned him. 
Despite these, these seasons of depression, God changed his perspective. And he learned that God actually can give you hope in the hard times. And that's, that's the final impact that gratitude has. It gives us hope in the hard times. Gratitude can give us hope in the hard times. And that is why in verse 7, we get these words. Though I'm surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You will reach out your hand and the power of your right hand saves me. The, the Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you've made me. Though I'm surrounded by troubles, maybe it's a lean financial season. Maybe it's that grim diagnosis or the grueling recovery that you've... Maybe it's honestly it's just each and every day knowing you've got to go to high school. David says, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand and the power of your right hand saves me. It's this image of God. He, he, it's like he just reaches out his hand and, and his giant hand, yeah, not my like little scrawny hands, his giant hand is like a shield for us. Or, or maybe you're a video gamer <laughs> and it's this imagery of God just taking us and just plucking us out of our situation. Like respawn or something. Is that what it's called? I think that's what it's called. The Lord will work out his plans for my life for your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. David leaves us with this song of thanksgiving where he declares his confidence in God. He, he reminds himself God's love will not end. And we think to ourselves, how, how, David, could you be so confident that the, the Lord's love is going to endure forever? Well, because he knew the story. He knew the story of his people for thousands of years now. He'd been able to read the story of how God had taken care of his people. But David also saw God's hand at work in his own life. Time and time again, countless times, God saw, or David saw how God was working. And he had come to know God's character is, is to keep his promises. And so to that end, he prayed. He said, God, don't forget the work that you've begun. And in the meantime, I'll say thank you for all you've done. And the same confidence and gratitude of David can be ours. As you look to those personal trials, as you face them head to head, as, as we think about our church in our culture, when, when bills are being made about conversion therapy and abortion and charitable status for, for nonprofit organizations, and we think to ourselves, how could we possibly survive? Well, because we know the story. We know we're, we're 13,000, or sorry, thir we're 3,000 years down the road from David. We've actually seen the greatest fulfillment of this psalm. Jesus, the son of David, comes, and we know the story. He, too, like us, cried out to God in his hour of need in the garden. Do you remember? He cries out. And from the cross, he quotes David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But we also know that three days later, after he died, he rises. And God's perfect plan was fulfilled in Jesus' life. And because we know God kept his promise with Jesus, he, he fulfilled the plan, we know that when he promises to us that he's, he's coming back for us, he's, he's not going to abandon us, he's not going to leave us on our own, we know that we have that hope too. It's ours in Jesus. And, and so we too can be thankful. So this Thanksgiving, <laughs> as you gather around the table, let's not just make it our goal to all of us now, let's say what we're thankful for. <laughs> Which, hey, that's a good thing to do, by the way. Keep doing that. But let's make it our goal to show gratitude each and every day. Let's make gratitude our goal, and then, then we'll be able to live out what, what Paul told to the Colossians. 
a beautiful summary of, of how we should live out this truth. Colossians 3, verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Each and every day when you wake up, when you go to bed, in the way you live, make your life a thank you. And then remind yourself that that the same truth David knew is true for you. Lord, you won't abandon me. You, You will fulfill your good purpose for my life because your love endures forever. The way that Paul said it for us after Jesus is that he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. And so the question becomes, have you thanked God lately for what he's doing in your life? Are you willing to trust that he will fulfill that plan in your life? Let's pray. God, sometimes when we say things like thank you, um, it can just be reactionary. It can just sort of slip out of our mouth without thinking of it. But Lord, I pray that for all of us, this Thanksgiving, we would make it our goal to thank you from our hearts. In the way that we, we treat our loved ones, even when they test our patience. In the way that, that we um, tell the story of your goodness even for people who may not believe what we believe. Lord, I pray that our thanksgiving goes well past this weekend or this week, but Lord, that in everything we do, whether it's word or deed, whether it's at church or outside of this building, we pray, Lord, that it would bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.